How do you learn who you really are? It's not found in books. It's found on the battlefield. All right. What's up, Christine? Good to see you back again. Good to be able to talk to you again. Great to see you too, Rick. Happy to be here. Yeah. All right. So we're making a movement. I even put you on mission last time that we talked. If you build it. Yeah, I'm pretty excited. Yes. I can't wait to hear your progress. Can't wait to hear your dream and can't wait to hear some more of your story and like, what is it that we're doing here? So if you can, some people may not know who you are yet and maybe they don't have TED Talks and they haven't seen you yet. Maybe they don't know, but give us the short version and then build us up to what's the purpose? What's the goal? Yes. Yeah, so the short version is I was, well, my name is Christine and I was born with a bilateral cleft with a palate. And that basically means that I have a birth difference where the roof of my palate and my upper lip didn't properly form before birth. So I needed more than 20 surgeries to be able to eat and speak normally. I endured endless bullying, overcame a lot of adversity, being told I would never amount to anything. And today I'm a TEDx speaker. I'm an advocate for the cleft community. I am a confidence coach helping other people with all their confidence and overcome their issues and improve their self-esteem so that they can live the life that they want. And now I'm here talking to you to help raise awareness and help society understand and learn what the cleft lip palate is. Yeah. All right. So some people are like, okay, she's doing a thing. There's surgeries involved. I have no idea what it means. What the heck is a cleft lip? Please help the people who don't know what they don't know. <laughs> That's a great question. So what happens, and not to get too scientific, but it's really rather interesting, is that when babies are formed in the womb as a fetus, we actually begin as two halves, and those two halves form together. Somewhere around week 10 or 12, I, I don't remember exactly, the two halves of our face and our head come together to form one. And that's why you have that little divot under your nose, and yeah, and, you know, it comes, comes a whole lip, and that's why your palate, the roof of your mouth is nice and smooth. And someone like me with a cleft lip and palate, the two halves never fully close up and form together as they normally should. So for me, I have what's called a bilateral cleft lip and palate, where there are actually two parts that the uh, skin, the muscles, tissue, nerves never form together, and that extended into my palate. So instead of my nostrils all I guess for lack of a better word, closing up together, they stayed open and it went all the way into my upper lip and into my palate. Whereas some people have what's called a unilateral cleft where only one side of their lip is affected. Some people only have the lip affected where it doesn't close. Some only have the palate where it doesn't close. But either way, the lip is open and the palate is open upon birth. And so surgery is needed to close it so that we can eat normally and speak normally and just breathe normally. Mm. It's a lot to take out. Also, I didn't know that. I didn't know the halves go together to me. That's pretty interesting. Just didn't know that. <laughs> I didn't know that. It really is. Yeah, there's some way around YouTube. I haven't been able to find it easily, but there is a video. Uh, I think that a scientist did a, a camera in the room uh, photographing the entire development of a baby from uh, the very first, like when it was starting to develop all the way through uh, full development. So it's really, yes, yeah, really rather interesting. Yeah. The, the, our, our, listen, just being a baby is interesting as it is. I remember <laughs> my uh, our oldest daughter, she showed me uh, an x-ray of a toddler's skull and how it has two rows of teeth, like it's a shark or something. I'm mm -hmm. like, that's bonkers. <laughs> I'm blown away. So listen, babies are crazy as it is, even even without like having the like the parts not connect like mm -hmm. it's, it's crazy even when it's right <laughs> so i'm single all right let's get into like all right so this has happened and you have created a movement or you're creating the movement to try to help people out in this area where are we going like we've got people who are this way and we're going to get into some of the story stuff and we're probably going to real talk we probably have to at least address the elephant in the room uh kids are mean kids yes. are mean and so we'll address adults, the adults too. Adults are people. Yes. People can be mean. We're going to get yeah. into that. We'll get into first if we are an inclusive state of people who are trying to include everybody. All right, what are we trying to do here? What's the goal? What's the, what's the the purpose? And then let's reverse engineer this into how did this become? 
Yes. So my main goal is to raise awareness within society, ideally within the world. I, I'd like to start, you know, in my own backyard in the United States, raise awareness. The biggest thing, I guess, that really, um, I don't want to say it irritates me, but the biggest thing is that the incidence of cleft lip palate is one in 700 babies worldwide are born with this birth difference. That is the same number as the number of babies born with Down syndrome, one in 700. Now, if I mention Down syndrome, you know what it is immediately. You know the characteristics. You know how to identify if you see someone out in the world with Down syndrome. You know, you know what it is. It's not an anomaly to you. If when I'm reinforced when I said, hey, I have a cleft lip palate, you didn't know what it was until I explained it. Many people like me don't know what it is. I've even met doctors and dentists who would say, yeah. I think I'd read about it in a medical book when I was in med school, but I never saw anybody with it. And that kind of my passion is like, why is it the same incidence as Down syndrome, but nobody knows as much about it when it's been around for thousands of years? It dates back to BC, where the first recorded incidence of a child with a cleft lip and palate was in China by a doctor there. So, I mean, King Tut had a cleft. So it's not like this is relatively new, but it's just one of the best kept, well, unfortunately, not really the best, but a, a really well-kept secret. So my main passion is to raise awareness, have everybody know what it is, young children, adults, everybody, so that when they hear cleft lip and palate, there's no misconception, and they know what it is. They know it's not something to be afraid of, and they know it's not a one-and-done surgery. They know it's a lifetime journey of obstacles to overcome. So that's my main passion is that uh, education and awareness. I like it. I, I actually did know a kid growing up. I didn't know the details for how does it happen? How does it work? Mm -hmm. And what he had to go through. I just knew the guy was hilarious. Like he would crack us up. He was just a <laughs> funny dude. But like, I didn't understand enough to even have like the judgments around it. I just wasn't a judgmental kid. Like, so mm -hmm. I was, I was very, I was cool with everybody. I didn't have a lot of like, well, they're different. So I hate them. Like I hung out with everybody. So even even though like this guy, he had a cleft lip, I didn't understand what it was. I just thought he was just one of the guys I knew. And so right. I didn't know the details. I just, I had no clue. What does it mean? What are the surgeries? What, how does that happen? Where does it, I just liked that he was cool and made me laugh. So I didn't know. <laughs> but I think that it's right. like, one thing, I gotta, I'm going to push a little because I, this is maybe my personal beliefs or maybe, uh, maybe I need more information. I have a hard time with people who are just awareness without practice. Now, when we talked before, like saying like, hey, did you know there's a thing? And they go, yeah. Now what? Mm -hmm. Like, we're going to do what? Now there's a thing. But like, what are we going to do about it? Which would probably lead me to the next biggest problem. Now that people know, let's say you're you're very successful and you do it and everybody knows what it is. Like everyone, there's no more questions, no more mm -hmm. misconceptions, no more. We didn't know. Christine was very successful in her campaign. Now we know. Now what? What's the, what are we going to do? Now they know. What's the plan? What are we going to do with it? Right. Well, the next plan is that, and then this is where my real ultimate goal and my dream is, is that I want to build a vibrant community for all adults, children, and parents of children with a cleft lip and palate and caregivers of people with a cleft lip and palate can come together. Right now, most people with a cleft and myself included, when I was growing up, we feel isolated. And it's just because we very rarely see others with a cleft. We, uh, because of the shame that we felt, we don't want to talk about it. And again, because of the lack of knowledge, the community is not, it's growing, it's becoming stronger, but it has a long way to go yet. And my ultimate dream is to see that vibrant community, like many of the other social communities out there, you know, so that you know, inside communities, that new children born with a club as they grow up, they can have that place to go, that safe haven with other people who know what they're going through. So that a new mother who has been diagnosed with her unborn baby has a club, knows where to turn to without the fear. She can relate to those other mothers who say, yes, I've been there. I know what it's like. Your baby's going to be fine. And so they can also look at people like me and say, okay, you know, in 20, 30 years, here's what my baby's going to be doing. Here's what they can do. Because I can only imagine the fear my mother felt when I was born, wondering what kind of life is she going to live? I remember when I was growing up, wondering when I was 10, 12, even 20, 30 years old, what am I going to be like when I'm in my 30s and 40s and 50s? And now I know. But also, most importantly, you know, I have a dear friend. She's 
you know, uh, she's in her mid seventies. I, I I apologize that I can't remember her age, but she's advocating for the senior community to get out there and be known because they also have needs and they're also alone. And so my ultimate dream is to bring together everybody who is affected by it in a national and ultimately a global community so that we all have that place to go. We can connect, we can communicate, we can support each other. I see it. I'm all right. Again, you already know I ask harder questions. All right. So <laughs> I see the part where we're being inclusive and it's easy to say people want inclusion. I want to be included. I don't want to be ostracized, bullied, picked on, or, or treated as different um, for something that's not controllable. You know, and I think that no matter what the dynamic it is, uh, whether it be gender, skin color, or, you know, uh, cleft palate, mm-hmm. like no matter what, I don't want to be excluded. I don't want to, don't exclude me because it's something that's not controllable. And so let's say we get the, all right, the awareness is out. People know what that is. It's less, it's less controversial. It's less uh, ridiculed, whatever the, the inclusiveness would be. But then we also have a community that, you know, has a reputation of isolation, has a reputation of being reclusive, has a reputation mm-hmm. of not just being ridiculed out of the social groups, but excluding themselves because they feel different. Now, right. with that in place, is there any risk that these communities can also by themselves create isolation and exclusivity? Or how would you like? Be like, I got to make sure that we're creating more of like our groups are connected with everybody Mm -hmm. by doing a community thing. Like, I got to hear your dream. I want to hear your vision. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah, there's definitely a big risk. And I've seen it happen just by nature where people, you know, birds of a feather flock together. And not that there's anything wrong with that. People stick with what they know, what they feel comfortable with. But my ultimate dream also, in addition to building this community, is to empower the community with the confidence and the self-awareness and the strength and the self-worth that they can go out and reach their goals and be actors and actresses and lawyers and doctors and professional people. And I do know some people already in the community that are lawyers, uh, a retired police sergeant, a professional ballet dancer. There's actually a couple of actresses. I know of a woman now in Canada and she's I doing her own show. I know of a, of a model. So it is my goal. And I know so many other people who also have those dreams of doing that, but it's their own uh, self inhibitions that are holding them back, which is understandably. And I never thought, you know, when I was growing up, I would be talking to you on a podcast and giving a TEDx talk. So, and that's why I became a coach is to also help those people reach their goals, go out and get their dream jobs and do what they want so that we can fully integrate ourselves in the community and say, look, just because we look different doesn't mean we can't be on the next big hit TV series or the next big pop fashion movie, or we can't be a model on the face of a magazine and we can't be, you know, police sergeant or the next fire chief or the next, you know, Supreme Court justice. So, I mean, that's also where I... Ideally, I'd like to go once we build this community. So I think it, it, it's, you know, I mean, it's Martin Luther King talk. It's like, I want to be judged by <laughs> the content of my character, not the way that I look, you know? And so, absolutely, yeah, I can see that too. But I think some of these ones where it gets a little bit trickier is some of those careers are only how you look. A model, for example, is like, that's judgment only based on mm-hmm. looks. And so... It makes it a little bit trickier to change the norm on this. Um, this, how do you feel on that? Because this is going to be one of those things where, like, uh, just statistically speaking, people in the modeling industry are more symmetrical. Like that's mm-hmm. like, I know that this, I know that this beak right here is not as symmetrical. I know that like any given right. day, this beard's going one way or another. So I know that this isn't going to hit symmetry, but I know that. Um, and some of those, what would be some of like, we're going to change the norms. We're going to change what it is. Or is it kind of like one of those things where like people are trying to make what used to be socially unacceptable, beautiful, or is it more of an appreciation of reality thing? I'm, I'm really just trying to see which way are we trying to evolve this? I think it's more of an appreciation of reality, but also just an advancement and the maturity of acceptance. You know, I look at where we were 10, 20 years ago with the gender equality and where we are today with the, the gender community being much more accepted. Yes, we still have a long way to go, but we came, you know, leaps and bounds. The same difference with where we were in the 60s and racial equality to where we are today. And while we still do have a long way to go, especially in light, of the Supreme Court ruling and colleges, 
And, and I know that was a major setback. We have made advances and there will be times we take two steps forward and one step back. But I think it's a changing of societal norms and that acceptance that it's not how we look, it's what we have to offer. There are many Down syndrome models who are now, uh, you know, in modeling. I, I've seen a Dove commercial that shows female Down syndrome models. And I think that is wonderful. And I applaud Dove for doing that. And, you know, I've also seen many commercials that have women of color and women who have um, scars from either burns or other facial differences. So I think it's just a matter of time until people with cleft lip and palate can be models and, you know, can be in those positions. I realize that just because we have that facial difference doesn't affect our intelligence. I like that. Okay. Fair enough. Fair enough. Well, let's get into more acceptance then. All right. We got cleft lip and palate, but what about people who also have different, like deformities grow, like being born? One of my one of my good friends was born where he was never able to feel the lower half of his body. His, his spine never attached to his lower half. He's only been in a wheelchair his whole life. Mm -hmm. He was born different. Now, he didn't mm -hmm. have the cleft lip and palate, but he also, would he be able to benefit from this community? Um, he could, but my ideal goal is because there are so many other communities for people that are either, you know, limited to wheelchairs or have everything. I'd like to, I mean, ideally, I'd like to keep this to be specific to the cleft lip and palate. So while he may get a secondary benefit and that it would raise awareness of people who are different, who do have physical or limitations, um, I don't see that he would be a, a, a member of the community directly. But I think that, you know, a rising tide lifts all boats. So yes, raising awareness about our differences would help him indirectly. All right. I see where you're going. All right. So we have to start off with this one out of 700 first. That's already a big number. And then yes. we'll then we'll see how it evolves. Fair? Exactly. Okay, cool. Exactly. All right. Do we have a community already? Is there already a place that people can start going to? If they hear this, like, Christine, that's my son or that's my daughter or that's my brother. Is there already a place we can start directing people to go to be a part of this community? Yes. Right now, there is a Facebook group. I do have a Facebook group with a community of parents, adults with cleft lip and palate, and individuals, you know, teenagers and, and people who do have a cleft lip and palate. It is on Facebook. It's the cleft lip the community for, you know, people that's worldwide. Uh, there are a couple of other smaller Facebook groups, and I am currently in the process of building a much global community that will be off of social media, but also hosted in a community platform. So that people can go, uh, right now the Facebook community is international and that will always remain international. My off social media community will be US based for now. In the UK, there are some other UK based communities. And again, that one is exclusive for UK residents. So again, there's these little partners with communities. Um, and I think it serves it well to have communities that are geographically based, social media. And again, it fits the needs uh, accordingly. I like it. Okay, so it's, it's growing. You're starting the movement. People can go and yes. connect on Facebook, cool. but then also locally in certain areas. Absolutely. All right, let's go into one of the obvious things. This comes from need, not greed. This comes from things that have come up that like have to be addressed regardless of finances. I need to make sure that this community has the awareness. Let's talk about some of the stuff that's uh, this. this affects a lot of people. Getting picked on. Yes. Adults, kids, let's switch over. Let's get into like, okay, what's the message that you would have for like the people who are like, you know what? I don't know what that is. So I'm going to be mean to it. Like put your coach hat on or even put your, put your uh, <laughs> mother goose hat on. Like I'm going to take care of my flock. Like what, what is it going to be that you would say, listen, like raise awareness. Don't pick on these kids or, you know, here's what you need to know when you're doing that. I would start with parents uh, and the adults. You know, adults, you're an adult. You've been around the block a couple of times. I mean, use your, use your smarts, use your brain, and realize that just because someone has scars on their lip does not mean it's anything to be afraid of. And that's, you know, I've learned enough to know that people are afraid of what they do not know. And I cannot tell you how many times I've met adults and I've been judged because I have scars on my lip that they were afraid of me and not afraid that I'm going to hurt them. But they, that's why they bully me. They use it as a defense because they don't know what's wrong with me and they don't know how to react to me. They don't know what to say. They don't know how to talk to me. They don't know what's wrong with me or how I'm going to talk. 
So they use that bullying or that offensive behavior as a defense. And I know that they're not mean and malicious intentionally. It's, you know, in a way, human nature. Maybe they were never taught. Maybe they were just not exposed to people who look different. So I would say to the adults, educate yourself. Expose yourself to the people who do look differently. There's so many YouTube videos, so many pictures. You know, just take a moment and look at them and get comfortable with it. I know it could be, you know, a little uncomfortable to look at someone like me that has scars or especially, you know, a baby that has a cleft lip and palate. And I'll get into a very important point about that in a minute. But look at those pictures and sit with that discomfort. And then once you would that, teach that to the children. I found that children are sometimes a little bit more accepting of people who look different. I think it's just the innocence that children have. But teach the children that just because another child looks different than them doesn't mean they're to be afraid or feared or picked on. Teach them that it's what that other person does, their heart, their behavior, their actions, that really is going to say who they are and how to treat them, not how they look. I like that. Go in with curiosity of a child versus yes. the judgment of a wounded Absolutely. human adult, if you will. Mm-hmm. Um, I really There's a couple of things I want to tap in there and just add in a couple of parts to reinforce what you're saying. One of the things, like, I'm going to switch my coach hat on a little bit. When somebody says, what's wrong with you? What's wrong with you? What's mm-hmm. wrong with you? It's more of a, what's wrong is you don't know enough yet. Mm-hmm. There's nothing wrong with me. It's that you don't know much about what it is you're talking about yet. You don't know what that is. And so if you don't know what it is, you judge immediately. This is where I'm going to go into a version of uh, Carl Jung. He has a quote that I really enjoy. It says, um, thinking is hard, so people judge instead. And I'm going to add a little bit. I'm actually going to, I'm going to make an addendum. I'm going to change a little bit. I'm going to say thinking and empathy are hard, and that's why people judge instead. Mm-hmm. There's no way to, to go like, well, let me at least understand or put myself in your shoes in any way, shape, or form. In fact, they first go, you're different, you're bad, you're weird. What's wrong with you? And the only difference is, is I just don't know enough yet, so I judge I don't understand. Stay with us. We'll be right back. Warrior, thank you so much for being a part of the information that we have. And you're part of our story as we are a part of yours. It's very much an honor to be able to connect with each other. If you want to know more or you want to get started with working with me or working with our warriors so that you can begin your path to authenticity, strength, leadership, and accountability, this is the way. Together, we are way stronger. Now you get to choose. Do you go forward or keep doing what you've always done? If you stay where you're at, hey, click on some of the stuff and follow what it is. We got motivational stuff. We've got podcasts. We've got more things. Just subscribe and do the stuff and we'll keep you updated. But if you want to start going in, start jumping into what our programs offer and start your journey and being the hero in your own story. Absolutely. And it's also, I think, it's it's not only the fact that they don't know enough, but it's also they think, what if it happened to them? What if it happened to their child, their son, their daughter? What would they do? And that's where that fear comes from. What if it happens to their grandchild? And I think, you know, again, that's where that fear comes from. And I've been told many times, what's wrong with me? Why do you talk that way? You're ugly. All of these things. And I've had to, you know, over the years, you know, doing the self-development work, learn to realize that it's not personal. It's really their issue and their problem and their fear. And they'll feel like, oh, my God, that could have happened to me. Could have happened to my son and daughter. Could happen to my grandchild. You know, and, and their discomfort over seeing someone that looks different and their, almost their own shame that they're embarrassed that they don't like the way someone looks. And I think that's what a lot of it is. I've learned this as I've grown older. And even my own self-examination, because again, I wouldn't be human if I admitted that. You know, sometimes the first time I saw my own baby picture, it was difficult to look at. And so I thought, okay, why is this difficult for me to look at my own baby picture? And other than, you know, of course, the shame. But I said, well, because it's not, what I was told babies are supposed to look like. And I think as a society, we have that preconceived notion. Just like we talked about earlier, that preconceived standard norm of what models are supposed to be, what they're supposed to look like. So when that that cognitive dissonance comes in, the people like, oh my God, I feel 
ashamed or I feel like I'm a bad person. They had that self judgment to deflect that self judgment. They put it out there, they project them onto someone else. And then that's why the person that usually looks different is the brunt of that negative projection. Yeah, I like that you said that shame, ignorance, fear. There's all these pieces in there that people don't know. And so, mm -hmm. you know, if there's something we don't understand, we start to almost attack it immediately. But I, I thought it was interesting you said how many people, is it is it that common that people share? Like, it really would be scary to me if this happened to somebody, you know, my family or something. Is is that a common fear that's come out in a conversation? I, I don't, I've never heard of that part. Mm -hmm. I haven't heard it directly in the communities because the community has been so supportive. But the people that I have talked to outside of the community and who uh, they trusted me and I trusted them and they know they can speak freely with me, they have shared that one on one. You know, a couple of podcasts which I've met with off the record have said that, you know, they, they spoke freely. Uh, my father's reaction when I was first born, he told me to this day how he was completely panicked and scared. My grandfather, to the day he died, had a hard time accepting me because I wasn't perfect. And, and in his eyes, I was defective. And my mother and even I was often told growing up, well, it's a good thing you never had children because they may end up looking like you. And I always thought, well, that would be a bad thing. At least I would know what they're going to be up against. And at least I would know how to help them, you know, make it through and, and overcome the challenges. But still, again, it goes back to the ignorance and what we don't know. And I have heard some mothers that said, you know, I mean, that was one of the things I was told in the schoolyard. At least my, my daughter didn't look like that. And, you know, one of the things our parent often said is, I don't know what I would have done if my daughter looked like that. And, you know, I mentioned that in my TED talk. And so, yeah, it is that common fear. Um, and, and that's where it originates from. I got to give you some credit on the armor that you've built up. And I'm going to warrior talk with you a little bit. The armor that you built in acceptance and understanding, especially some of these sentences have, have caused permanent curses on people. You know, I couldn't, mm -hmm. I couldn't accept you because you're defective. Like that, you're not wrong. This is a shame and doubt curse that starts leading into depression very easily. You know, um, mm -hmm. it's a good thing that you did not have children. What a twisted way to say this is what love is. Like, mm -hmm. what? <laughs> Like, yes, that's it can it can cut your soul like like that's such a hard sentence. It's a good thing you didn't create beautiful, amazing life. It's like, mom, I know you're doing your best, but fuck. Yeah. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. And to cope with that shame for probably 45 years of my life, I. You know, I, I put on the armor. I denied having a cleft look and panic. I denied that there was anything wrong with me. You know, I learned later, and as my therapist told me, that was what I did to survive. That was the only way I could have survived. Because if I actually took in and really listened and really heard those words and internalized them, I really would not be here today. I would have either been committed for, you know, insanity or institutionalized, or I would have actually killed myself. And as I did get older, I mean, self-harm and suicide were, they were friends of mine, as much as I don't like to admit it, but I'm going to be real. They were friends of mine because as I started to go through the self-development path, the pain was really, really tell and painful for, you know, just kind of mildly and the shame and the lack of self-worth and the lack of believing in who I was and realizing what I did. But yeah, for the 40 plus years of my life, denial was my armor. And that was how I survived. It is a testament. And this, this, is, this is a tricky part for people because uh, people will judge denial and anger as um, forms of weakness. People judge so quickly, but they're not all negative. Sometimes this can be like, I'm just going to put a pin in that for 40 years because I don't want to deal with the reality <laughs> of it. Like there's a, there are also positives that can come out of it, but um, denial is not cheap, though. It is expensive no. and it takes chunks out of you too. And this is where there's at some point you have to live your life of authenticity and be able to accept yourself. And um, kudos to you to be able to break out of your own self-made prison that you called protection, um, even though like it did have you isolated and closed off. So it's a really mm -hmm. tough game. And, and by no means is this like exclusive to just like, you know, like the cleft community. This is humans. Like people do this for multiple reasons, but it takes like, I think I'm going to lean back into where you said parents, 
Like these things that your grandpa said, mom said, and like dad said, like the things that people said, these are supposed to be resources for for love or safety, security. And, and, you know, this is my place where I can recharge or be my place of peace. But a lot of times some of the meanest curses that all people are growing up with come from like this source. Yet we as parents don't realize the damage that we do throwing around, you know, the parts of us that we aren't okay with onto somebody mm-hmm. else. And these are generational things. These are these are problems that like, you know, either you have to break the curse or uh, your kids or somebody, you know, that you've passed this on are going to have to break the curse. But mm-hmm. to have that level of judgment, I, I think let's lean into that a little bit. Like I want your, I want your coach hat on for a minute. Like, mm-hmm. like people will attack confidence, attack unknown, and they will remove empathy and go, you know, right into judgment. You know, you're defective. Good thing you didn't have kids. Like that hurt my feelings here. I, like, I'm like, that's just, that's just not cool. And maybe that's me being judgmental, but it's almost my heart took a hit hearing what your heart hit. Like, mm-hmm. I'm like, dang, mm-hmm. that's tough. That's, that's, that's tough to handle. What's your opinion on these judgments and this stuff? We live in a very judgmental world and a very judgmental society. And also, I think, you know, the time I was growing up, I was born in the 70s. Uh, my, and, and I'm thinking about my mother. My mother desperately wanted children. I mean, that was, again, her ideal was grow up, get married, have children, get the white picket fence. Well, she didn't quite get the white picket fence. She had the children, but, you know, her first one, I was the oldest of two. My sister was younger. My sister does not have a cleft lip. So she got married, um, you know, not to school family secrets, as my father said, but she got married more out of necessity than out of, you know, true love. Um, again, I think it was a generational thing, and I think it was just her own family environment. So I think, and, and again, I don't know her because she did pass, you know, five years ago, but I think if I had to, you know, just guess and put my coaching hat on with her too, I think there was a lot of guilt on her end. She wanted me so badly. I know she took fertility drugs. It's not known for sure if those fertility drugs are what caused my cleft. Doctors did not know. I, I mean, they said maybe, maybe not. It's not known for sure. But it could have been. So I think, and if I had, I never talked to her about it. But I, I'm sure there was some guilt there on her end. I also believe that she lacked the emotions and the empathy to really be that nurturing, loving mother. But also knowing what I know of her, and this is the one thing that I do credit her for, is that she was always uh, very headstrong, very adamant, very, you know, just very vocal and very controlling. So for her and for me being born the way I was, she always said that I was something that needed to be fixed. And to use that language, I was something that needed to be fixed was both a blessing and a curse for me. Because her attitude, I need to be fixed, is what got me the medical care I needed and what meant that she was going to go and find out the doctors, the surgeons, the dentists that could work on me and not just sit idly by. But it also left me feeling like, okay, I'm broken, I'm defective, and I'm going to be that way the rest of my life. So like I said, it was a blessing and a curse. But I think she had a lot of that self-judgment, and that also just wore off on me where I applied it to myself. And I think as far as my father, I know, again, the generation that he came from, uh, my his father, my paternal grandfather, uh, never accepted anything that wasn't perfect. My paternal grandfather always believed that, you know, you have to be perfect. You have to, you have to look fine. You can't, you know, there is no room for imperfections. And so I think that's why my father had that trouble accepting me as well. You know, that here we have, you know, Christine, she's going to have a lot of medical needs. And I think the two of them got the emotional maturity to be able to handle it. And so I think that's what a lot of parents struggle with when they have a child, you know, it's hard enough being a parent to begin with, as I'm sure you can probably relate. And then to add in the issues of like, oh my God, that I create this child that has these medical needs, that has this stuff. And there's that added guilt onto it. And, you know, side note, no, there was nothing the parent does or didn't do that when it created this. That, that is a known medical fact. So to all the parents listening, there's nothing you did if you have a child with a class. Um, uh, but again, there's still that guilt that could be there. So, and then self judgment. We're just all, you know, as humans, we're self judgmental, and it's hard not to be. I gotta get, I'm really, I'm very excited to hear this the way that you're talking, because I can see the evolution that you've gone through 
you know, a lot of people would take the opportunity to go like, no, you know, my mother just, she was ignorant and she didn't know. But I hear you speak in terms of grace and uh, understanding for both your dad with uh, with his perfectionist curse that was put on him and uh, with this thing with your mom who was trying to like fit up to some sort of societal norm. But like the the part where you said you need to be fixed and mm -hmm. on one side she can work on you physically and that's the part that she found was where her value was is I need you to physically look a certain way so she'll invest in what that looks like. But you know, for you to do the work mentally to go like, there's a lot of damage that was done inside here. Not just, it's not this, it's inside mm -hmm. here. It's inside here that the damage is done. And for you to take that, you know, re personal responsibility to go, I'm going to do the work. I'm going to do the mental work. So I'm going to do the hard mm -hmm. work. And so it's good. To, you speak in terms of acceptance and grace for people who wouldn't give it to you as part of what you do to teach. Cause like, it's a testament to go, are you actually good at what you do because you do it or because you took a seminar and heard about it? So it's cool to see you actually put this into like my actual belief system is that my mother, she deserves forgiveness for gra and grace for her doing her best. And my dad just wasn't given the tools to be able to accept because he was never accepted. So on you, well done. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I think this is a, this is a, a good testament to the type of leader you're going to be. Um, as like the groups evolve, that you're going to be able to have people be able to say, "Hey, they're not going to get it, but that's okay because you can still forgive people who don't understand." Absolutely. And the one thing that I learned is, you know, I'm fifty. I'm going to be fifty three years old next month, and what I learned is I can live the rest of my life holding on to the anger and the resentment I have for my mother for what she didn't do and that was be that nurturing mother be the emotional mother give me the support I needed you know that's all I ever wanted was for her to be you know to go shopping with me to, to have that mother-daughter talk and what I've learned and again this is with the help of extension therapy is that we cannot give what we don't have and that is not something to be held against it took me a long time to really realize and to accept that and that my mother just because of her upbringing, because of who she was as a person, whatever she went through as a child, which I don't know, she didn't have that emotional capability to give. And as much as I wanted it, I was never going to get it. And asking her was never going to happen. So I had to forgive her for it and say, you know what? What did I get from her? And, and what am I grateful for? And realizing how things could have been and that at least you know when I hear stories and I read articles of parents and other parts of the world and even in the U.S. and I just read an article last week of a mother in Florida um, who was brought up by manslaughter because she did not uh, her baby was malnourished and she didn't feed her baby who had a cleft lip um, I think that could have been my mother she could have just said you know what I can't handle this this is too difficult too hard I'm just not going to feed her and you hear them all the time in China. Parents don't want to deal with it. So they just let the baby starve to death or abandon them or, uh, you know, throw them in the river to drown them. It's horrible, but it does happen. And when I think about that, I say, you know what? My parents stayed married until the day, the day my mother died. She, when I was, you know, in my 20s, she's the one that called around and says, look, you need to find work to get your dental work done because your dental work is going to last forever. And she help me find the resources. So I think, okay, you know, that was, that was her doing the best she could. And the shame with my father, he may not have had the emotional strength and the maturity to handle it. But again, he always provided for us. He may not have been with me during the operating, you know, the operations or in the hospital, but at least he drove me to the hospital and he kept working and bringing money to help, you know, pay for things I needed. So I look at it that way. I look at it as, okay, what did they do? Not what didn't they do? And, you know, that's just the type of person I am also. I'm, I'm a very compassionate person and I always think I'm like, you know, what can I do to, to forgive them? Because holding on to that anger is not going to help me in the long run. Well said. That's a lot to take in too. But I like that you said that we cannot give what we do not have. And yet to have an expectation how uh, people think like mom should have been this, dad should have been this, friend should have been this, people from school should have been this, you know, like whatever the scenario, people should, should be. And they get into these expectations that create massive disappointment. It's uh, 
it's a tough game and it sucks to hear the darkness of this world that people are, you know, doing to the, like you said, the cleft com- community where little kids are just tortured or, you know, mm-hmm. like that, like to that, let something starve, like anything, any animal, anything to have something starve to death. It's just mm-hmm. such a brutal way. You know, mm-hmm. like, or even Absolutely. Just, like, there's just monstrous things that we can do when we have, I mean, just the deep curses inside of people, like the type of pain you have to have to watch your baby starve to death. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. In the case of that situation, uh, and I can actually email you the article to include in the show notes, the woman, um, she had the baby and they went to the hospital, the doctor said he didn't think there would be an issue with the mother nursing the baby. And I was at first angry at the mother. And then when I read the article, and this again happened a couple of weeks ago, I was angry at the doctor for that statement. He didn't think it would be an issue for the mother nursing the baby. It is well known in the community that babies with a cleft of the palate have difficulty nursing because they're unable to latch onto the nipple to properly nurse. There are special bottle nipples for babies to be able to nurse. I couldn't nurse at all. My mother had to feed me formula with a spoon and make sure it went down my throat and not through the airway out my nose. And I was at the risk of malnutrition. So to hear that doctor say he sent the mother home with the baby thinking it wouldn't be an issue is what makes me most angry. And it shows the lack of education within the medical community, but also the lack of follow-up that no social support was provided to that mother to make sure that she was caring for that baby, regardless of the fact that the baby was had a medical issue, just as a newborn baby of any, you know, a, even a normal newborn baby, I think that mother should have received a social services follow up. So, and that's what the biggest, my, my biggest takeaway was like, okay, that shows the gap. That shows the hole that needs to be filled. But yes, it also does show the dark side of humanity that does exist. It's not just things of the past that we hear, but things that happen in present day. And it's sad, but it's also why we can need to continue to raise that awareness and educate. Yeah. I'm, I'm with you. I mean, we try to find silver linings like the, the, the loss of that baby makes it so we have, you know, uh, it, it puts a flashlight on that part, of the, like the issues that need to be brought to the table. And it's, it's a very good point too, is a lot of times people are, uh, they just go, you have the white coat, but that doesn't mean that you really understand the situation. And so I, I really commend you for being able to say, first, let's start with awareness. Then we build movement and we start. Uh, you know, you'll have a community in a place that like goes, Hey, this is common knowledge now. Uh, you know, being able to say a hospital should know that, you know, mothers with these babies, they know they're going to have an issue with nursing. Like it's not, we're not, we're not surprising you with this, but there is make sure they have this education. If this is the situation before they leave, mm-hmm. otherwise Absolutely. We're, we're dooming that mother and we're dooming that child. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, I see. I see the crusade. I see the. I see the the battle ahead to make sure that <laughs> yes. there's noise here. Um, what what more can people do? Let's say there are people who are empathetic to the cause, and they're like, "I need, I, I need to get a, to be a part of this." Um, I've got a niece with a cleft, or I've got you know my my best friend's daughter, or something. Like, give me a, like, how can we start making more noise? What do you want people to do if you were to like, make a wish? People could do this. Where where would we start? What do we need to do? Continue talking about it. Continue sharing pictures of babies with clefts. You know, it's great that we're having this, uh, recording this podcast today. Um, July is Cleft Awareness Month, and, you know, we're at right at the beginning of the month. And so there is a movement right now on, on, on Facebook, and I'm actually encouraging everyone in our community. I actually have a template I made on Canva. Everybody's posting their baby pictures of themselves when they were born with their cleft milk and palate before they had their surgeries. And that movement actually came out of a uh, situation that happened on Facebook a couple of months ago where a mother posted the picture of her newborn son um, who has a cleft milk and palate. She posted it a couple of hours later. Facebook pulled it and said it was offensive and went against their guidelines. She reposted the picture 24 hours later after she had time to collect her emotions and calm down. And I was able to grab a screenshot of, you know, her comment saying that Facebook pulled this picture, cited it offensive. I was appalled. I was like, how can I, I Facebook do this? And of course, you know, I speculated or maybe it was just there on Reddit flagging. Maybe somebody really did look at it. I don't, whatever the reason, it doesn't matter. But the fact that Facebook pulled that picture 
a cute baby picture of this little boy because they said it was offensive. And I said, no, that uh, we need awareness around this. We need something. So that's why I'm encouraging everyone in the community who has it left up, no matter how young or old, post your baby picture, make them public because Again, like we talked about, the more people that see others with a cleft lip, whether it's uh, scars, someone older, someone younger, the more awareness we can raise, the more we desensitize to what it was like. And it becomes normal. And talk about it. Share it. Uh, you know, let's educate those doctors. Let's educate the young medical students about it as well. They're, the, they're our future. And so let's let them know as well what we have against. You know, my TED talk goes a long way as well to educating people about it. I talk about it there. I talk about it, what it was like growing up. So communication is going to be the best part. I'm always open. People can always ask me questions. And I'm always happy to, you know, happy to, to share my experiences. All right. You can tell me if you don't want to go here on this one, but it seems pretty wrong, you know, just, just as far as a moral standard of like just treating people with basic respect to say if somebody was to post their real baby picture, not with, you know, making fun, not with ridicule, not with, you know, malicious intent saying this was my baby picture. And for someone to say this is offensive com content, the sen the censorship from like social media and what people decide, like, you should be censored or you should be censored. What's your opinion on this? And and you don't have to go into it if you're like, I don't know, that's not my thing. But like you've you've been victim of this, where not even victim if it's not the right word, but you've been attacked by this social censoring that somebody who is born looking like you is offensive is the mm -hmm. reason that they would say, we're going to take down any of this information. It's going to be tougher to raise awareness of just reality is offensive. What's your thoughts? Mm -hmm. Um, you know, I've all, I've never been one to back down from a fight and it just makes me dig my heels in and fight further. And if I had to start by hanging up posters on street corners of baby, babies with cleft lip and palette and, you know, handing them out on the street corner, I'll do that because to me, pictures and awareness is the only way we're going to start changing people's minds about it. And, you know, I, I've often wondered why social media pulled that picture. I do think that someone reported it as offensive. Uh, and again, I think it goes back to their own feelings. They saw the baby picture of, you know, the baby before he had a surgery. It was, you know, they found, may have found it disturbing. It may have just made them feel uncomfortable. And they only want to see cute little happy baby pictures. You know, it's like want to see cute little furry kittens or something and things that only feel good. They don't want to see the raw reality, which is really what it is. You know, babies are born with birth differences all the time. And that is the reality of life. And I think many people don't want to realize that. I know my father didn't want to realize that for the longest time. I know I didn't want to realize that. I didn't want to talk about the fact that I was different. And so I think that's why it was pulled. I think that's why somebody might have reported it. I don't know for sure that somebody reported it. But to get back to your question, yes, it is going to be, you know, a David versus Goliath battle fighting against social media. They keep pulling these pictures. But again, little by little, we won't change it. You know, this is not the first time the social media, and I don't mean just Facebook, I mean in the movies, has victimized people with cleft lip and palate. I wrote a blog post about the movie uh, Knock at the Cabin that was out earlier this year. They portrayed a, a young girl from... Asia. And again, my beef was the stereotype. She was a young Chinese girl. She had a cleft lip. The actress did not have a cleft lip herself, but the problem was that the, actress, the character in the movie was adopted with a cleft. Very stereotypical since most Chinese children with clefts are adopted. Uh, my beef was again that it was stereotypical. They got some of the warning and the terminology of cleft wrong. And that they cast an actress who did not have a club. Um, you know, so, so I kind of want to blog post raising awareness, correcting it, asking, uh, Hollywood to kind of do better. Will they? We can only hope. Maybe they will. Uh, there's many actors out there who have a club. Stacey Teach, Cheech Marin, Jesse Jackson, many famous people with a club. I'm hoping that they will, you know, continue to use their platforms and help raise awareness as, you know, we can. Uh, but I think. You know, I'm just going to hold out. I'm going to keep hoping and I'm going to keep moving forward. And I say that society and social media is not going to hold me back. 
I don't. I didn't know anything about like the the cabin movie. But was there any way, even as an awareness, that there was any benefit from them trying to portray, even if it like? Because I think just about anything has like the interpretation is not going to mm-hmm. be absolutely accurate or perfect in almost any field, not even just this. Like, mm-hmm. name anything; it's always going to be portrayed by somebody's you know perspective. Was there any benefit that this would raise awareness positively at all? Well, you know, I'm always an optimistic person and I always say that, hey, you know, even bad news is good news and even, you know, a negative. I mean, yes, they mentioned it. And by mentioning it, at least it's some people who say, okay, you know, we saw the little girl, the character that had the score and they did mention it. And it was brought into the dialogue early on in the movie. Um, and yeah, so there is that awareness. I guess my biggest issue was that a little bit of research would have used the correct terminology. Uh, what really bugged me the one was they use the term hail lip, which is an offensive and outdated term to refer to cleft lip and palate. I think if they just Googled it, they would have seen that the correct term is cleft lip and not hair lip. But I also, again, me being really understanding, hair lip is still a very common term among people who grew up hearing that term. Even doctors used to use that term all the time because many years ago, that was the term for it. It's kind of like, you know, just what it was called, a hair look. But nowadays, it's very offensive. It, you know, it means that many of us were called. Uh, it means it's very triggering. And it dates back to the old, many, many years ago where there's a lot of myth, myth, mythological and a lot of just cultural beliefs around where the war came to be. So uh, that's why, you know, kind of trying to eradicate that word now is not referring to it as, as that anymore. Yeah, I definitely need some more. Give me some more in, insight on this one, because I've, I've never heard the term hair lip to be offensive. I never even thought about that as an offensive word. So for it to be considered offensive, mm-hmm. I, mm-hmm. if you could, I'd like more information because like, you know, I, I see the same thing. Like, look at any community. I mean, they say little people or a midget or, you know, name mm-hmm. anything. Like, right. People are like, that's offensive. That's offensive. You're like, exactly. but is mm-hmm. it? I don't know if it is. Like, why? You know, like, mm-hmm. you know, versus well, saying like, you know, I'm, my last name's Yi. I'm an Asian. It's Asian. But if someone said like, right. like you're, you're Chinese or even like called me like your chink, I'd be like, right. I mean, I'm t- I mean, like, I don't know if it's offensive. I think it's more in the way people use it or the way people say it. So I'd like to hear, like, why is that offensive? I don't know why hair lip, what it means or why is that bad? I'd I'd like to know more. Right. Well, there's a couple of reasons why it's bad. To begin with, uh, many of us were called that name growing up. You know, I was called, hey, you know, hair lip, bat lip. You know, you got hit in in the mouth by a horse. So it's triggering of the days of being bullied. But it's also offensive because it refers to a rabbit and not in a nice way. Because if you look at a rabbit, they do have buck teeth. Many children with a cleft lip and palate, their front teeth don't grow in or their front teeth aren't protruded because of the way the jaw forms. So that's also part of the reason why the nickname hair lip was applied to a cleft lip because the front teeth are a little bit more pronounced and do it like that of a hair. But also it goes back to the old folk story of the days of old. And again, back to, um, I don't remember the culture, but when in the folk story, there was the sun and the moon and the sun, if I remember correctly, wanted the moon to do her bidding and the moon didn't want to. So she turned her into a hare or a rabbit and she split the lips that she would forever be ugly and nobody would want to, you know, do her bidding and the moon would not have any beauty. And that's where the term hair lip came from. So there's a lot of different things about it. I actually wrote a blog post about it. And there's also some of the entomology of the word where it came from. Uh, but and, and it's still not quite fully known within the community that the word is offensive. There's still a lot of people with a cleft lip that are affected by the word. There's still, you know, I just met someone a couple a couple of months ago and they didn't even realize that the word was offensive. And so there's still a lot of education around that too. Uh, I wonder if it, this, I'm just going to go devil's advocate a little bit. I wonder if giving a power so much, uh, giving a word so much power is a benefit or a detriment because, um, yes, granted, like I didn't know about that. Thank you for sharing hair lip. Mm-hmm. Is, I didn't even know it was associated to rabbits. I didn't even know. Mm-hmm. Like I was thinking hair, like this hair, not hair. Right, like, right. Hair, hair, yeah. I didn't understand. I was like, is it because there's a scar line and it looks like a hair? Like, I didn't know what you meant. So it meant rabbit. It meant rabbit, mm-hmm. rabbit lip. Um, wouldn't it make more sense to kind of do almost like a, 
eight mile Eminem style of like, if we just take power for that word for ourselves, it doesn't hurt us anymore. Versus saying that word is offensive, and we take offense, and we're going to try and make anybody who uses a word we don't like, and we're going to judge you. Wouldn't it make more sense to go, yeah, that's what it is, but we call it this now instead of being offended. Wouldn't that be more mm -hmm. powerful? Or I just want to hear your thoughts. It would be more powerful, and I do agree with you, but to get to that point of power would require the community as a whole to also work through the pain and the, the, the issues of the past. And there are so many in the community, and now we're going to touch into a whole other avenue of the psychosocial issue. But there are so many in the community that have unhealed wounds, the emotional scores, the mental scores of the childhood trauma that they dealt with of being bullied, that I I just, I think it would take a long time for them to be, the community as a whole, to be okay with the word. Uh, you know, I know there are many Facebook groups I'm in, just some people reading the word sends them into a day-long triggering tailspin of PTA, PTSD coming back up from them because of the bullying that they endured as children and even sometimes, you know, some people even had their own relatives. Like I did bullying them and, and just repeatedly using that word. And so for the people in the community who have not had the healing or been through the healing journey that I did and were different stages in their healing, it would be a big ask for them. And, you know, and that's okay. I mean, everybody's at a different level of their healing. So hopefully, ideally, maybe in, you know, another couple of generations, we can be there. But I always say it's baby steps. And for now, we kind of meet everybody where they're at. Yeah. I, I think I go a little bit the other way. Just, you know, as far as like not all damage that's done to you is your fault, but all healing is your fault. And so like for mm -hmm. you to take on like, all right, um, there are people to, to hear a word and then go into a frenzy to say like, well, their frenzy from them hearing a word, our best defense right now is to tell everybody what they're allowed to say. It's like, well, hold right. on. That's no, that's just they can't handle this word. Let's work with them on this word and get them grace, acceptance, understanding, because we're asking for grace, acceptance, understanding. I don't necessarily agree to say that um, censorship when we're trying to fight censorship or judgment when we're trying to fight judgment would be as beneficial. This is where just I, I think for me, it's one of those things where the um, one of the, oh, the few things that offends me is people who get offended. Because they try and dictate right. how everybody else is allowed to speak instead of working on their own thing. You know, so right. I said, Christine, I don't like that word. And that word makes me feel not okay because I haven't dealt with that shit yet. So you need to talk different from now on around me. This way, I don't see that as it's right. I have to dictate your speech because I can't handle it. I just, I think right. it'd be better for me to work on like, well, people will say things that, I don't agree with, but that doesn't mean I have to tell everybody how to say things. Right. And and I completely understand where you're coming from, and then I understand your perspective. And, you know, in that same uh, that same thought pattern, we can share that about any of the other social words, you know, racism words, the words that we use to, uh, you know, address the gender communities. I agree. Words like we said to, you know, little people. So it's kind of like, you know, in the same vein, it's like all the other socially unacceptable words. So, I feel, I that, feel the same on all of those, too. I feel yeah, the same. It's understand. like yeah. we, we just have to, we can just agree, like, hey, we don't use that one just as a community. It's considered rude. But to say... I'm so offended. I'm shut down for a day because of it. Well, that's me. Right. You know, and so like for any word, if somebody says a word and I give that much power to somebody because they've used one syllable or two syllables, like that's, that's a me. That's my. Right. And so right. I would lean more into it's not what people do, but how we handle what people do would probably be where I'd give more power. Versus saying like, oh, well, people will say words and you, hey, you have to have your total freak out and then we'll tell everybody what they're allowed to say. I don't agree with any community, any culture, any race, any gender, any, I don't agree with anybody telling people what they're allowed to say or not say. Just, just not be a person you hang out with then. Fair enough. Right. Like, right. Right. What, what's more likely the way that we can choose how to handle something or that we're going to educate everybody to speak properly? Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. So I would just, I, that's just my opinion. You don't have to do anything. With it. I'm just saying, I'm just saying that's, I mean, right. like, it's easier to help that person go, hey, it's okay. People say dumb shit. Like, it's fine. That's part of it. Instead of saying, like, yeah. 
everybody has to stop saying dumb shit. I'm like, it's just a way tougher. I, I think in a way some people realize that, but I also, you know, within the community, we try, I think we try to, we work on protecting our own. And I think that's just, because we've been so hurt, I think there's still a level of protection that we like to extend to our own. And at some point, you know, that may be, um, it may be unattainable long term, maybe something that we might not be able to keep. Um, I think a lot of ways, because our community is still new and we're still growing, I think we're also still finding our own feet within the community of how, what what do we do? What are the levels of protection? What are, you know, kind of like what's the own internal rules? Yeah. It's t- I, listen, I, I don't take away from your battle. That's for sure. It's, <laughs> it's not easy and right. it's kind of uncharted territory a little. I just, I think I just uh-huh. go more from like, a balanced perspective on any of these problems. I know that um, yeah. hate and censorship or uh, being offended and anger uh, very rarely brings peace and understanding. And it doesn't mm-hmm. matter what it is, whether it's race or gender or, you know, defects or differences or skin color. It doesn't matter what it is. It can be anything. And right. I think that starting off with like, you know, I hate what you said and don't do that and demands and you know, ridicule. I think that using hatred or offensive, you know, behavior or censorship to try to bring peace and understanding. I think one of the things I heard Joe Rogan say once is it's uh, the the best way to beat bad speech is with better speech. Like, you know, just we'll, we'll keep talking and understand. But I think anybody who stops anyone from being able to share, even if it's something you don't like to hear, means that there's never any place to have understanding, growth, acceptance or peace. It's only going right. to just fuel the the volcano to explode in a different way, you know, because as soon as somebody took down the baby pitcher, it lit a fire. And I don't agree with that, like censorship to say someone's going to post their baby pitcher and someone says, I'm offended by your baby pitcher, that lit a fire under you. That was wrong, you know, so to say like you using a word, that's offensive. You, I'm going to take your word down because that's offensive. It feels like the same thing to me. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So I, would just I understand. Go, I would just go, we're looking for acceptance for this baby's picture. No different than I'm accepting that you didn't know that that word's not that cool. Mm-hmm. That's a really good point. That's really good. So that's just my opinion. You can, hey, take it or leave it. You can do your, it's your community. <laughs> I'm just throwing my two cents in. Hopefully, right, right. Hopefully helpful. Hopefully, maybe. But that's just where I stand on this because I, I, uh, I often find myself struggling with the polarization of this day where people are trying to create absolutes and something that requires a little more listening. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that, that can be difficult in those absolutes. And I think it's just everybody also trying to find their place. Yeah, and it's okay to have a place, but I think that using the foundations of the things that you don't like to create it, it just perpetuates mm-hmm. the same thing over right. and over and we call it different. But I think mm-hmm. it would just, it would it would maybe create, create using... A judgment to fight judgment, uh, it would just create more exclusivity versus inclusiveness. It would just be a concern as it's big. I want the cleft community to be successful. I don't want you guys to <laughs> create a whole right. new set of problems. Like those people are mean. Like, right. like no, right. absolutely, <laughs> I agree. I do. Too. I want to. I want to be such, I want it to be successful as well. Well, thank you for being open with it too, and and that's a, it's just a, it's a little more controversial of a question. So thanks for being open to to hear that. Um, I think this is very cool. I want to see. All right, we've got. Let's let's go big dream. Let's dream big together. Okay. All right. The awareness is there. A community is built. People know about this. No longer shamed. No longer judged. It's common knowledge. And now we're doing a movement. And now people have a place to go. Is there going to be like a headquarters or a thing that like there's, you know, your own club that people can come to? Is there a, what's the, what's the, what's the goal here? Like, if you need a place that you can feel like you belong, it's going to be like, you know, multiple locations. What, where is your, where, how far does your vision go? (laughs) Well, ideally, you know, and, and right now my vision goes, you know, I do want to mention Smile Train because people might hear about Smile Train. And Smile Train is a global organization, but their main focus is that they train medical professionals in international countries to perform cleft or cleft lip and pa- cleft lip and palate surgeries. And the benefit is that for children born in countries like Africa and China and you know India and South America, where they may not have the surgeons that are trained, 
they have the surgeries there. So that children born there can go to those local medical centers and get the surgeries and live a normal life. So, and that smile trains main focus. There's Operation Smile that does similar work with their missionary. So my main goal is, you know, in building this community, and like you said, big dream, I would like there to be a headquarters where we can have little geographical regions and people with a club can come together, can socialize, can get the support that they need, can just talk about the challenges of like, yeah, I, you know, I just went through another round of surgeries or, you know, I'm going through another round of dental work and implants and I'm just tired of it. Or, you know, hey, my baby needs the surgery again. You know, can I get some just emotional support? And, you know, can, or maybe just like a surgery buddy. There's little pockets. There is a small little group of moms in Indiana. Um, you know, she has a group, I'll give her a shout out called Legendary Smiles in Indiana of moms who, support other moms of cleft babies. Um, there is little partners, but ideally I'd like it to be under one global, um, one at least starting nationally umbrella, where whether we're adults, we're teenagers, we're parents of clefts, we're senior citizens, no matter the age, we can come together. We can just have a powwow and just complain about what it's like to have, you know, surgery number 30, 40, 50, and say, you know, I'm in my 50s and I need dental work and I, where am I going to come up with the money to get this dental work because insurance won't cover it. And again, that's a whole other avenue to talk about the insurance. And just to say, you know, hey, let's just go hang out and, and just go have fun and, you know, all go out and, and try to drink through straws when we know we can't drink through a straw and laugh <laughs> about it. Well, something like that that we can all relate about and just have fun and forget about you know, the fact that we had these issues for a day and, uh, you know, just hang out with each other. So that's ideally what I would like to have these little uh, geographical communities so that we can get together. You know, right now, Smile Train is having annual events. We have one in person coming up in New York City in the end of July. It's CleftCon. They do have a virtual one that's international in November. Uh, so that, you know, it brings together the community. It brings its public for anybody to attend it, those are great. But again, I'd like you to see it go bigger and I'd like to see it go, uh, you know, much more globally. I love that. Are you going to be at the, the CLEFCON, like, you know, promoting like the unity that you, you envision? Well, believe it or not, and some people are couple of my close friends. Nobody really knows about this yet. So I guess now the cat's out of the bag. That's what the cat is. I am going to be at, yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, but I am going to be at CLEFCON. And, uh, you know, I guess, I mean, thanks to our, conversation that we had a couple of weeks ago where you actually motivated me and kind of held me accountable uh and and this is you know we talked about this this is a dream of mine that i'd had for a long time you just more or less you know got that file lit and i gave me that little nudge to you know just move forward so since we last met i have been talking to people about it i made it more of a reality and i've done a lot of soul searching says you know what this is my calling and this is where i'm meant to be so yes i've been talking to people about it one-on-one and it is my goal at Cleft Con to talk to some more people in person that I know are going to be there, close friends of mine, and to, you know, do some more talking and, and laying that groundwork for it. So I am going to be at Cleft Con in July. I will not miss it for the world. Yeah. And like, I'm really proud of you, too. Way to go to say, you know what? You're right. I, it's time to do. It's time to get that warrior mm-hmm. side out. Time to build. <laughs> time to do some things. I like it. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Good, good job. And it's, it's exciting to see. Like, uh, let me ask you real talk. How do you feel now that you feel in motion? Like you're like, oh, you know what? This is the direction. I will build this. I am going to start making it move. I'm going to start connecting these people. I will build the network. I will make it work. How fulfilled do you feel knowing that your mission is underway? Well, the interesting thing is that those who knew me best know that I've been talking about building this community for about a year, but I never believed in myself. And I always thought, you know, yeah, you know, I had excuses, and I think we even talked about that again when we met a couple of weeks ago. And then, you know, you talked about well, make, making it a nonprofit, and I, again, I came up with excuses, and I, I, I still wave on that. And then the more I've been thinking about it, the more I say, you know, I can see myself meeting. I, my values are connection. My values are bringing people together. My values are helping. My values are educating. This ties in with my values. This ties in with who I am. And the more I think about it, the more I say, I like leading people. And the more I think about it and the more I say, you know what? I want it to be a nonprofit because this is not me. This is not about just me. And that's where I really feel strongly because I've had some people talk me out of doing it as a nonprofit 
because of all of the complexities. And I'll be honest, I come from a business background. I've worked in business and for profit as, you know, a solopreneur, an entrepreneur in corporate America for, you know, 30 years. So I know everything there is to know about corporate America. Nonprofit, I knew nothing. But here's the irony. Last night, I was thinking about this. My mother worked for a nonprofit Montessori school for 40 years. I don't know why I never thought of that until last night. I worked for two nonprofits before I went into corporate America, a cancer foundation. And I also, now it's slipping my mind. Um, well, the Girl Scouts, I was at Girl Scout and then I worked for them for a couple of years also. And now Smile Train, I volunteer with Smile Train. So when I think about it, nonprofit has always been part of my life and you know my mother's life. But more importantly, when I think about this, I say, you know, this is not about me. I, I don't want to make all the decisions about this community. I don't want to make all the decisions about this. I want other people involved because it's about all of us with a clock up and pound. It's about the mothers of those children. It's about the adults. It's about the teenagers who will one day be adults and the babies who will one day be teenagers. And that's what really makes me passionate about the community and making this into a larger nonprofit organization because it's about all of us collectively. And I just want to be the leader. I just want to be the catalyst, the one that brings us all together and that kind of facilitates it and makes it happen because you know, I know that I'm a visionary. I know that I have those ideas. And I also know that I want to share those ideas with others so that we can, we can just say, you know, lot on to say, yes, we did this together and we can stand proud and look back at what we did, not just me. I love it. Can I give you, can I give you a weapon? Is that okay if I give you another tool in the toolbox? Absolutely. Doubt, doubt had me down for almost 20 years. Like doubt was my biggest attacker. I didn't understand him, but now I get him. I had coffee with doubt. I do it every, I have coffee with doubt all the time. He cracks me up with his, with his attempts. But it sounds like doubt's been paying you a, a visit and excuses gets involved to try and reinforce your belief system. I see what's going on here. Let's go ahead. There's going to be people who will bring doubt into your picture. It's inevitable. You're going to be pushing against the grain. You're creating something beautiful. You're, you're, you're making a dream a reality. And doubt attacks through motivation. It's going to come in through the thing that makes you have that fuel, that drive, that fire. And it's going to come in and try and mess up your belief system around how much potential you have, how, many, how much action to put into it. And the results are going to keep reinvigorating this. Let's catch doubt first. So the definition for doubt is that doubt offers you nothing, but takes from you everything. You've got this beautiful dream, this dream to help others, a dream to unite a community, a dream to give hope to children who are being picked on or misunderstood, for parents to no longer have to feel guilt and shame. You have this huge opportunity to take one in 700 kids to be able to have a damn chance or that paperwork will be hard. So you should quit. Which, which one do you want to pick? Oh, there's, there's no question about it. You know, I want those kids to have the chance and I want them to have the chance that I wish I had growing up. Correct. So I know, and I know my way. I know I'm a fighter. I wouldn't be here if I wasn't a fighter. I know that they'll be, I'll find a way to get, get over that paperwork, to raise yeah. the funds, to get that nonprofit set up. You know, and I know I won't. Just sure. my mind always gets in the way, well, and I've been where, told that. Raise that awareness, though. This is you're doing mm -hmm. an awareness campaign. <laughs> raise the awareness of these. These attacks may look mathematically correct. Look at the statistics. Look at the numbers. Look at how complicated this will be. That's a lot of paperwork to go through. Yeah, these are all things that are true, but also manageable. Like. I, I get what you're trying to say. Stay between the lines. Play it safe. Don't take a risk. But you're offering mm -hmm. me nothing. There is no offer. It's saying don't do something, but not offering what to do. Right. And this is how doubt offers nothing. And so be aware when people will try and have good intentions. Just trying to keep you safe, Christine. But the cost of your safety means that there are thousands and thousands of children and families who are left high and dry if you do take an offer. And so being able to be aware that like you're offering nothing, it is absolutely as soon as you catch doubt in the works, you go, what's the offer you're offering? Well, I just, right. I just think it's going to be really hard. I hear you, but are you offering a solution, a faster way, a, a person I need to network with to speed it up? What are you mm -hmm. offering? 
No, I just think it's going to be hard. I'm like, <laughs> thank you for nothing. I, ex I decline your right. offer. I'm not going to accept that. Thank you for sharing. Like, I can't use right. that. And just be very aware that people will try and kill your motivation, kill your dreams, kill the feelings you have around what your purpose is, but they'll offer nothing to do so and to accept it as a catastrophic mistake that we look back and we were. But in the time, it could come from somebody who's very close to you. Absolutely. I, I definitely can see that. And, you know, what I also realized, too, is that if it's meant to happen, there'll be a way for it to happen. But I also realized that there's thousands of nonprofits that have gone out there, gotten started and gotten up and running. So it can't be all that hard because people have done it. There's been ways of been paying. <laughs> you know, and so, and I say, you know what, I'm smart, I'm resourceful, and this is, you know, and this is a good cause, so I, I say that it can happen, you know, if it's meant to happen, it'll work out. I love That's it. how I look at it. I like that warrior in you. It's good to see that warrior glow, too. You're like, there's going to be a fight. <laughs> there's supposed to be. Let's go. It, it wouldn't be worth it without a fight. Yeah, absolutely. It's it's an honor. I, I praise you as a warrior. It's good to see you going into the battle and fighting for something you believe in. So kudos Thank to you. Thank you so much, Rick. If, if there's any closing thoughts that you're like, okay, I need to share this and then let's call it. Like, what would you, what would your message be? Or do you just want to direct people on where to go? Please, war is yours. Oh, I don't even know. We've covered so much and I'm so grateful for this platform. Uh, you know, just be nice to people, educate yourself, uh, you know, ignorance. I mean, ignorance because you know where the education opens up a whole new world. You know, you have my website. I know that you'll probably put that in the show notes. So just visit my website. My inbox is always open and I always appreciate any and all support and help. And if you or someone that has a cleft open palate, you're a mother or a child or someone with a cleft, reach out to me. I love to make new connections and I'm always here to support the community and support you. Even if you're not on social media, uh, you know, you can get my email from my website. So thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Love it. Well done. Thank you so much, Christine. It is always an honor and a pleasure. We will have this up soon and we are going to put your stuff everywhere as much as we can support you. We will, because I think it's a noble cause and I think you are definitely built to be the right kind of leader. Thank you so much, Rick. Again, I really appreciate this and I appreciate the opportunity. Yeah, we'll be in touch. Thank you again for the time. We'll talk later, but thank you for helping. Thank you for your battles and thank you for sharing. And uh, Thank okay. you. Same to you. All right. Keep up the good fight. Right. Thank you. You too. <laughs> Bye, Christine. Bye-bye. Click on the button and you can become the hero in your own story. It's time to start making the choices to change. And the evolution that you're going to do begins with choosing the next step. This is the way, and together, we're always stronger.